Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and the what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers the Fourth Amendment, excessive force, and suspect descriptions, and is brought to us by Don Andre Investigations' channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On January 20th, 2021, 40-year-old piano teacher Jamal Williams was eating lunch in his vehicle, which was parked on the street adjacent to a park in Hacienda Heights, California, when Deputy Bruno de Oliveira and Deputy Alexander Tavali of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department approached his vehicle. The deputies were responding to an alleged burglary that had occurred about a half mile away from Mr. Williams' vehicle involving two black male suspects in their 20s, where one suspect got away on foot. The interaction that followed was captured on both officers' body cameras. Hands on the wheel. What's going on? You live around here? Hey, don't don't touch, don't touch, don't relax, touch, bro. Relax, hey, hey, you match the description of somebody, okay, that just committed a burglary in the area, okay, you're on camera, so can, don't can, can, step out of the car. Is your, is, your, is, your, is your body cam on? It's on. Yes, it's, it's on. on. What, what, step, step on out, dude. We'll explain everything to you, okay? Just step out of the car. Step out of the car. I'm not, I'm not stepping out of the car. You're being detained for a burglary investigation, okay, sir? So step no, no, out. no, 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 no. Do you live in the area? I'm not answering the question. I want my lawyer. Okay, okay. step out of the car. You're being detained right now. All right, step out of the car. Sir, step on out, dude. You're, Sir. you're on camera, dude, so don't do anything dumb, okay? When the officers first approach Mr. Williams, Deputy de Oliveira immediately opens the driver's side door and orders Mr. Williams to step out of the vehicle. A few seconds later, after Mr. Williams responds that he will not exit the vehicle, Deputy Tavali opens his passenger side door and leans into the vehicle multiple times. We will examine whether the deputies had the reasonable suspicion necessary to detain Mr. Williams later in this episode, but assuming for the sake of argument that they did, it is likely that a court would determine that the officers were within their authority to order Mr. Williams to exit his vehicle. As we have discussed before here on ATA, the Supreme Court held in the 1977 case of Pennsylvania v. Mims that an officer, quote, may, as a matter of course, order the driver of a lawfully stopped car to exit his vehicle. Now, although the officers did not stop Mr. Williams' car, as he was already sitting in his parked vehicle, the second appellate district of the Court of Appeal of California held in the 2013 case of People v. McLaughlin that when officers entertained reasonable suspicions that an individual sitting in a legally parked vehicle was involved in a burglary in progress a half block away, they were justified in removing her from her car, and it is likely that a court would reach the same conclusion here. However, it is also probable that a court would find that the officers violated the Fourth Amendment by opening Mr. Williams's car door and leaning into his vehicle. The Supreme Court held in the 1986 case of New York v. Class that opening a door and entering the interior space of a vehicle constitutes a Fourth Amendment search, and, as such, is subject to the same reasonableness standard applied to other police searches and seizures. In the 2020 case of United States v. Gumezi, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has jurisdiction over California, found that an officer's opening of a car door and leaning into the car constituted an unlawful search, because while the officer had reasonable suspicion sufficient to justify a traffic stop, he lacked, quote, probable cause or any other particular particularized justification, such as a reasonable belief that the driver poses a danger, to open the door to the vehicle and lean inside. Although the court recognized that an officer may open a vehicle door when there are, quote, particularized reasons for the officers to fear danger, such as when officers were responding to a reported shooting, the passengers in the car made furtive movements as the officers approached, and the car's windows were so darkly tinted that they prevented the officers from having a clear view of the car's occupants, it concluded that the officer in the Gumezi case did not have any reason to fear that the driver might be dangerous. Likewise, in this situation, aside from the fact that they were investigating a burglary, Deputy de Oliveira had no reason to believe that Mr. Williams was dangerous when he opened his driver's side door, and it seems unlikely that a court would find that his immediate passive resistance to the order to exit the vehicle would give Deputy Tavali a sufficient justification to open the passenger door and lean in when he did so. Step Hold on, I'm gonna get okay. this on camera. All right. Go ahead, you can record. Step into the car. Please. He's being aggressive. Hey, you, you, hey, hey, stop you, resisting, you, you, dude. Stop resisting. I'm just, well, why, just why are you? What, no, man. Okay. Get out of the car. Get out of the car. Sir? You need supervisor. I want to talk to your supervisor. Call 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 your supervisor. 
I'm gonna tase you, dude. Taser. Give me your hand. I, I, I don't, 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 don't give you consent to touch me. Don't reach. I don't give you consent to touch me. Stop. Don't reach. Just I don't stop. give you consent. Handcuff, handcuff, handcuff. I don't, I don't give you consent. Deputy De Oliveira and Deputy Tavali attempt to physically remove Mr. Williams from the vehicle. And he struggles against them for a few seconds until another officer threatens to tase him, at which point he allows the officers to remove him from the vehicle. As the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of California explained in the 2017 case of Lawrence versus City of San Francisco, because police officers officers are not constitutionally required to use the least intrusive means available to them. Quote, Courts have recognized that officers may use reasonable force to remove an uncooperative individual from a vehicle. Similarly, in the 2008 case of Whistler v. City of Fresno, the district court in the Eastern District of California held that pulling an individual who had not behaved in an assaultive manner but refused to comply with demands to exit the vehicle out of a vehicle, placing him on the ground and pinning one of his hands to his chest, constituted a low amount of force that was reasonable under the Fourth Amendment. However, in this situation, Mr. Williams appeared to be in the process of complying with the order to exit the vehicle, as he asked the deputies to hold on so he could film the interaction with his cell phone, when the deputies immediately started pulling at him from both directions and claiming that he was being, quote, aggressive and, quote, resisting, despite the fact that they had informed him he was permitted to film. Now, given this factual distinction, even assuming that the officer's had the reasonable suspicion necessary to order Mr. Williams to exit the vehicle in the first place, it is possible that a court could determine that the officer's initial use of force against Mr. Williams was unreasonable and constitutionally excessive. Likewise, if the officer who threatened to tase Mr. Williams had actually deployed his taser in response to Mr. Williams' attempts to remain in the vehicle, the use of the taser could also constitute excessive force. In the 2010 case of Bryan v. McPherson, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held that an officer officer used excessive force when he tased an individual who exited his vehicle during a traffic stop after the officer had ordered him to stay in his vehicle. In reaching this conclusion, the court explained that although there is a distinction between passive resistance, such as remaining seated, refusing to move, and refusing to bear weight despite police orders to the contrary, and active resistance, now quoting, resistance should not be understood as a binary state, with resistance being either completely passive or active. Rather, it runs the gamut, from the purely passive protester who simply refuses to stand, to the individual who is physically assaulting the officer. The court also argued that, quote, even purely passive resistance can support the use of some force, but the level of force an individual's resistance will support is dependent on the factual circumstances underlying that resistance, and ultimately concluded that the behavior of the individual who was tased was more on the passive end of the spectrum, and therefore provided little support for a use of significant force, such as a taser. Considering this case law, it is entirely possible that a court could conclude that Mr. Williams is mostly passive passive resistance would not justify the use of a taser under these circumstances. Be on Paso Verde and be on there. Hey, stop. Cuffs are on. Cuffs are on. Okay. Hey. Readjust here a little bit, all right? Readjust. Slow down a little bit. Hey, we got a, we got a supervisor right. coming, man. Yeah, copy. It is code 4. Fishing hands on scene. Just request. Hey, you got anything on your schedule? I don't have a question. Okay. Hey, can you record this? It's recorded. It's all, it's all recorded. Got recorded. We all have cameras. Here, they're good. Okay? You're okay. No, you're okay, man. Hey, on you. These, these, these guys are ridiculous. Yeah, we are. Hey, I don't answer questions. question. Okay, well, you're on, you're on video. Is your name Jamal? I don't want to answer questions. Okay. All right, cool. Makes it easy. Wait, Do we need that, or you want to take that off, and let's go ahead and just walk into a car? Yeah, we just pulled up on a car. I told him, hey, you'd be detained for, uh, you know, a burglary investigation. He matched the description of the burglary suspect, and he refused to get out. And all we did was just control holds and try to pull him out. Once we had him completely out of the car, then I just did a little takedown to the okay. ground. Cool. And uh, team hat, that's pretty much it. So once he was on down, that's when they showed up? The deputy explains that the officers approached and detained Mr. Williams because they believe that he matched the description of a nearby burglary suspect that escaped on foot. The suspect was described as a black male in his early 20s who was approximately 6 foot 1 or 6 foot 2 and wearing a blue hat with all black clothing and possibly a red t-shirt underneath. While Mr. Williams was 40 years old, sitting in a vehicle so his height was unknown, and wearing a maroon sweater with a dark gray t-shirt underneath and dark blue 
sweatpants. Now, before exploring the legality of the officer's seizure of Mr. Williams in this situation, it is important to understand that the Fourth Amendment is not always violated when an officer arrests or detains the wrong individual based on a suspect description. As the Supreme Court explained in the 2014 case of Hine v. North Carolina, quote, If officers with probable cause to arrest a suspect mistakenly arrest an individual matching the suspect's description, neither the seizure nor an accompanying search of the arrestee would be unlawful. However, the court also noted that the Fourth Amendment requires such mistakes of fact to be quote-unquote reasonable. And as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals clarified in the 2002 case of Grant v. City of Long Beach, quote, Under the law of this circuit, mere resemblance to a general description is not enough to establish probable cause. This statement of law was derived from the 1996 case of Washington v. Lambert, where the Ninth Circuit held that officers did not have probable cause to arrest two black men based on, quote, the purported general similarity of their physical characteristics to those of the actual suspects, two African-American males, one reasonably short and one reasonably tall. In reaching this decision, the court reasoned that the descriptions were, quote, exceedingly vague and general, because, now quoting again, there were, for example, no specific descriptive features, such as facial hair or scars, and that the individuals who were arrested, quote, did not even match the few physical details that did accompany the general physical descriptions. It should be noted that while Mr. Williams was found within a half mile of a recent burglary, the suspects in the Lampert case were not encountered in the vicinity of approximate crime scene, and this crucial distinction could cause a court to reach a different conclusion under these circumstances. However, in addition to determining that no probable cause existed, the Ninth Circuit also stated in the Lambert case that, quote, it is extremely questionable whether the tenuous general physical similarities give rise to even the reasonable suspicion necessary to make a Terry stop. But because the parties in the appeal did not raise that issue, the court did not reach a conclusion on this issue. Similarly, in the 2014 case of Hampton v. City of Oakland, the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of California held that a reasonable jury could conclude that an officer did not possess the reasonable suspicion necessary to conduct an investigatory stop on a black woman who was wearing a white shirt based on her purported resemblance to a cell phone robbery suspect who was described as, quote, an African-American woman in her 20s who was wearing a white t-shirt her car's similarity to the suspect's car, and her presence in an area where the stolen cell phone had last been tracked. Based on this precedent, it is certainly possible that a judge or jury could conclude that the officers did not have probable cause to arrest Mr. Williams, or even the reasonable suspicion necessary to detain him. Uh, no, I think this is, I think Bach will help me out. Okay. I can't, like right there, he's just feeling it. Well, you need this? Hey, if we take these off, are you going to cause a problem? Are you going to kick any windows out, anything like that? I don't answer questions. You can leave on then, that's fine. I don't give you consent to go on my car and check my car. You're violating my Fourth Amendment constitutional rights. We're going to sink him in the car. Has it been clear? Yeah. Alright. So, I think we should we can move forward and try at least get him in the back seat. Yeah, that's fine. Why are you guys kidding me? I'll explain everything if you just tell me your name so we can talk. Uh, tell me right now. Find a car and put it in there. Okay. We'll talk when he gets in the car. He's not your suspect, but are you saying yeah. Well, like, well is, if he's not the 459 suspect, suspect, then... I don't believe so. Did you finish the siege training? Yeah, I did the last one. 48. He's not going to jail. The siege training. Yeah, no, I know. I'm going to research the vehicle and see if the mask that the suspect was seen on picture that was taken by the informant is inside the car. After the deputies concluded that Mr. Williams was not the burglary suspect they were looking for, they informed him that they were still taking him to jail, and he was charged with resisting an executive officer in violation of Section 69 of the California Penal Code, which prohibits knowingly resisting, by the use of force or violence, an officer in the performance of his or her duties. Now, although Mr. Williams' physical resistance to the deputies' attempts to remove him from the vehicle was likely sufficient to support a conviction under this statute, as indicated by the jury instructions for this 
this offense. California law also requires that the officer be lawfully performing his or her duties at the time of the resistance. And an individual cannot be convicted of violating this statute if the officer was unlawfully detaining them or using unreasonable or excessive force against them. The resisting charge against Mr. Williams was eventually dismissed, although it took nearly a year for the charge to be dropped. After the encounter, Mr. Williams filed a complaint with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and Lieutenant Tri Huang investigated the incident and concluded that Deputy De Oliveira and Deputy Tavali did nothing wrong. On January 17, 2022, Mr. Williams filed a lawsuit against the officers involved, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and Los Angeles County. And on April 15, 2022, he voluntarily dismissed the case after reaching a settlement for an undisclosed amount. Overall, Deputy De Oliveira, Deputy Tavali, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department get an F for likely violating Mr. Williams' Fourth Amendment rights, maintaining a hostile and antagonistic demeanor throughout the encounter, and seemingly attempting to manufacture physical resistance on Mr. Williams' part by claiming that he was quote-unquote aggressive when he was simply sitting in his vehicle, potentially as a justification for using physical force to remove him from the vehicle. Instead of giving Mr. Williams time to step out of the vehicle of his own volition once he had started to film the incident on his phone, which the officers, by the way, informed him he could do, the officers immediately immediately began to apply force from both sides of him, in a seemingly contradictory and confusing manner. Additionally, legal issues arose during this encounter that we did not have time to explore, such as the search of Mr. Williams' vehicle, which potentially violated the Fourth Amendment, and the officer's use of handcuffs and leg restraints, which, along with other factors, likely transformed Mr. Williams' detention from a Terry stop to a de facto arrest that needed to be supported by probable cause. Now, while it is certainly possible that a court could conclude that at least some of the deputies' actions were legal, and much more likely that a court would find that they were entitled to qualified immunity given the murky state of case law on these issues and the high legal standard required for citizens to overcome qualified immunity, the deputies behaved in an unprofessional and aggressive manner from the beginning of this encounter, particularly given the vagueness of the suspect description they believed that Mr. Williams was a match to. And had they treated Mr. Williams with basic human dignity, I feel confident they would have received a different response to their attempts to investigate him. Likewise, had they taken the time to observe Mr. Williams and his behavior before throwing his car door open, they would have realized that he was older than the 20-something suspect that they were looking for, and that he was eating lunch in his vehicle, which would be highly unusual conduct for someone who had just committed a burglary. But instead of making use of the wide array of investigative methods available to them, the deputies immediately accelerated their conduct to aggressive detention and intimidation, and as a result, subjected an innocent man to demeaning and disrespectful behavior because he happened to have the same skin color as a burglary suspect. Mr. Williams gets a B plus because although his interests would have been better served if he had immediately complied with the deputy's orders to exit the vehicle, he eventually complied with the command, respectfully voiced his disagreement with the deputy's activities, and took appropriate action after the encounter by filing both a complaint and a lawsuit. This encounter demonstrates how uncertain and unclear the law surrounding police encounters can be, and the legality of Mr. Williams's conduct in resisting the officer's attempts to remove him from the vehicle revolved around whether or not they had the reasonable suspicion necessary to detain him, and whether or not their attempts to remove him constituted excessive force. Because the answer to these questions depends on the information known to the officers at the time, and could vary based on the judge or jury that ended up deciding these issues, it is typically advisable for citizens to comply with an order to exit the vehicle without resistance, regardless of whether or not the order seems reasonable to them. That being said, I completely understand why Mr. Williams felt justified in his refusal to exit the vehicle, particularly given the deputy's aggressive demeanor and their potentially excessive use of force. And I commend him for his commitment to his constitutional rights and his willingness to pursue legal action following this incident. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic that you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.